Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Bible class, and uh, I'm excited to be here. My name is Steve Wagner. If uh, we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I would look forward to that and consider it a great uh, privilege to get to know you. And uh, there should be an outline of our message for today. It, it ties right into what uh, Pastor Zach was talking about in early service. If you've been to the 8 o'clock service, you have heard a, a, just a terrific, terrific, what the word I used when I walked through the line and shook his hand was brilliant. It was a, just a brilliant message. And if you haven't been to uh, church yet, look forward to 11 o'clock. It's going to be uh, just a real spectacular opportunity to go deep into uh, this uh, most memorable speech that uh, is given to us by Jesus Christ. So uh, we're going to spend some time today, if you have your Bibles, it's in Matthew chapter 7, Sermon on the Mount. We're going to begin at uh, verse 1 today, and I'm just trying to get figure out which way's forward and which way's backwards with some slides. Um, history's most memorable speech. You know, there are, there are speeches that leave impressions and just kind of stay with us. And I thought it might be a good idea if we just sort of tested our uh, knowledge of that a little bit today. So I have a quiz for you, okay? A little quiz. You know, it's one of these things, uh, if you need to look at your neighbor, that's okay, but I'll be watching and making mental notes about that along the way. But I thought it would be kind of fun if we just did a little bit of a quiz. And the quiz is entitled, Shakespeare or Popovich, okay? So we're talking about memorable, we're talking about memorable kinds of speeches and things like that. And so uh, after the end of each of the little quotes I'm going to show you, I'm going to ask you the question. You'll get to vote. Was that William Shakespeare? Was that our beloved head coach of the San Antonio Spurs, Greg Popovich? Okay, so let's, uh, let's get started as we're thinking about memorable speeches. The first speech is this. All the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. William Shakespeare, let's see, hands, hands, or Greg Popovitz. Uh, Greg didn't score very well on that one. Let's see how it is. It wins William Shakespeare, so you're absolutely correct from the play as you like it. Okay, so the first one is Shakespeare. Here's our second quote. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I came to bury Caesar, not to praise him. William Shakespeare, Greg Popovitz. All right, let's see. Certainly was Shakespeare, Julius Caesar. Okay, Julius Caesar. So you're good. We are running at a perfect score right now. Let's check out the third, uh, third quote. Here we go. In my eyes, he's the stud of the world. <laughs> All right, now think about this. Think about this. William Shakespeare, Greg Popovitz. All right, let's see what we got. It is, and he's talking about Mano Ginobili, okay? Well, you guys have perfect scores. Let's keep going. We've got momentum. Here's our quote. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles. William Shakespeare. Okay. Coach Popovitz. One or two votes for Greg Popovitz. Okay. Well, actually, it is William Shakespeare, and that is from Hamlet. Okay. That's from Hamlet. So here we go. We've got just a couple more. We didn't send mariachi bands or birthday cards or breakfast in bed. <laughs> William Shakespeare. Greg Popovich. Okay, well, let's see. There it is, talking about a player on injured reserve. All right, one more. Now, most of you have perfect scores, but I want to tell you, I didn't set this up to create perfect scores. So let's see how memorable this last little quote happens to be. Cowards die many times before their deaths, like uh, the valiant never taste of death but once. 
Think about this. This could be a trick question, right? William Shakespeare. Okay. Greg Popovitz. Okay, let's see who got it. Ready? Oh! No, it's William Shakespeare. The answer is the trick question. Okay. Well, those are pretty memorable kinds of uh, speeches, don't you think? But I'm going to default back to uh, what, our, what our theme is, and that is history's most memorable speech belongs to Jesus Christ. It's the study that you've enjoyed with your pastors in the last few weeks, and it's the study that uh, is a point of much study over all of the generations of the church, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we will uh, get into Jesus' words, and we won't give Shakespeare or Popovitz credit for any of the stuff that we're going to look at going forward. Father, we're grateful for this time to be together today. Thank you for your goodness, your grace. Thank you for the mercy that invites us in to know the love and power, grace of Jesus Christ for time and eternity. Speak to us now about these timeless truths that are found in this most memorable speech, and we're praying this in Jesus' strong and precious name, amen. Okay, you have a folder on your uh, page, uh, on your table, and we want to take a look at the verses from Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse, um, beginning at verse 1. Let me pull that up on the screen for us. I'm going to be using the words from the uh, New International Version of the Bible, and it says, Judge not, or you too will be judged. For the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you into pieces. Turn and tear you into pieces. I have to tell you, that when uh, Pastor Zach said, we're looking at Matthew 7, I want you to teach on verses 1 through 6. He said, you know, it's that section of the Bible that says, judge not or you'll be judged. I'm sitting there going, where is the gospel? Where is the hope? Where is, is, how does this message relate back to uh, something that you give people that's going to tie right in to the way that we live every day of our lives? How does it help us to know Jesus better? How does it help us to know Jesus better? And I want to tell you that there's, I I hope that you will appreciate what the, uh, what Pastor Zach and what, what the depth of these words can mean for us to just that end, to know Jesus better, to follow him with a new sense of passion and verve and resolve to live for him. Well, I also like to always look at the paraphrase of the message when uh, I'm, I'm teaching or preaching, and so it, there are words that sometimes uh, uh, come uh, out, and, they, and, and you have another pastor's uh, interpretation of, of what the original languages mean. And so let's look at this, and, and uh, I want to share verse 1 and 6 from the message. Let's read this out loud together. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. Don't be flip with the sacred. Now, I like that paraphrase, but I think it has, uh, it, it, uh, quite frankly, it's just a personal opinion. I think it's a little bit wanting. I think it's a little bit soft. It focuses on external things more than uh, I think that the actual words of Jesus focus. But it helps us kind of engage the thoughts in a, in a contemporary and, and immediate way when it talks about this business of critical spirit, when it talks about not being flip with sacred things. 
So let's, uh, let's talk about the Sermon on the Mount, and let's talk about the context, first of all, of the Sermon on the, on the Mount. And the first thing that I want to help you to uh, uh, consider is this whole business uh, on context of, of the audience to whom Matthew is writing, the audience to whom he is writing. And for Matthew's gospel, it's important to understand that he is writing primarily to Jewish people. He is writing primarily to Jewish people. He's creating an apologetic, if you will, in this gospel. And the point of the apologetic is very, very simple. It's to help Jewish people understand that Jesus is the promised Messiah. That's what Matthew does not want them to miss. So there is this uh, Greek-speaking Jewish audience to whom uh, Matthew is writing And the Sermon on the Mount specifically, particularly, is to those who are his disciples, those who are are already engaged in understanding and considering that he is Messiah, those who have given their lives to this truth. If you go back to Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, so they got the first row seats. They were the close ones. So they were the ones who were right at hand. I had a friend when I was at the seminary who had season tickets to the uh, St. Louis Cardinals baseball team. And uh, this guy, I, one of my projects in, in spring and summer was for him to be my best friend because he had like six season tickets to the St. Louis Cardinal game. And they were like in the second row right behind the, the batter's box or, or right behind the on-deck circle where batters come out to loosen up and get ready because they're going to be the next hitters. And uh, I would say to him, you know, Larry, these are great seats. These are just fabulous seats. And he said, you know what, Steve? When Johnny Bench spits, we get wet. And I'm going, this is, uh, this is absolutely the coolest thing in the world, I'm thinking, you know. So when Jesus spits, the people that get wet are who? The disciples, his disciples. But there are a large number of people that he has invited to eavesdrop on this conversation. And so history's most memorable speech begins with that reality. We're talking to disciples. We're talking uh, to those who are my informed and enlightened and thoroughly dedicated followers. They're in that process. They're moving in that direction. So what are a couple of the things that are nuanced in the Gospel of Matthew that might be important for us that set the stage and bring us to this conclusion about the audience, Greek-speaking Jews? One of the things that strikes me as interesting about Matthew is that when you look to Matthew chapter 1, which is that verse in Scripture, uh, when, when I was at the Sim taking classes in New Testament Greek, one of the things I always enjoyed was the genealogies because it, 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 they sort of sounded like, the, the Greek names, and so if you could just pronounce the Greek letters, you, you could translate the name. It was, uh, you, you just said it in Greek. Well, so Matthew chapter 1, the first name mentioned is the name Abraham. Abraham. Matthew starts there, and he says, Abraham begat, 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 and, and that list with two exceptions is exclusively Hebrew. And Abraham, of course, is the father, through Isaac, of the Hebrew nation. So Abraham starts right there. When you read through the Sermon on the Mount and you come across, and this is point number two about the the Jewish flavor of this particular book in the Gospels. When you read through the Sermon on the Mount and you see him talk about the kingdom of heaven, And that shows up in a a number of different places. It doesn't show up in our text today, but it shows up in a number of different places. That is a Jewish uh, phrase that means heaven, eternal life. So the kingdom of heaven. And what you will find predominantly in the Gospel of Matthew as a description of Jesus, he is called the son of David. Son of David. So let's contrast that with some other places. You hear phrases like son of man, son of God, those show up in in, in other gospels. Uh, 
uh, kingdom of heaven shows up in a number of different places, but uh, it's also just listed as uh, heaven in other gospels. And Luke, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to me, Luke's genealogy in Luke chapter 3 of Jesus, it, it's the exact opposite of what, of what Matthew does. Matthew starts with Abraham and works down to Jesus. In the gospel of Luke, it starts with Jesus and it works back all the way to Adam, all the way to Adam. Luke had a little bit different audience. It wasn't a different genealogy. It's not, a, it's not a conflict in Scripture. It's just a different way of describing the same reality, okay? And so uh, Matthew starts with Abraham. So that's one of the things that we want to understand. We want to understand the audience. The second thing we want to understand is Matthew's purpose, the apologetic. Jesus is the promised Messiah. And he does this primarily by showing how Jesus' life and teaching fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures. Here's the phrase, uh, uh, a couple of phrases that show up again and again in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus will be teaching and Matthew will comment. This is kind of a, a parenthetical thought. He said, he said this so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Matthew will record an event in the life of Jesus Christ. It happened in just this way so that the Scriptures would be fulfilled. See, Matthew wanted Jewish men and women, Jewish families. He wanted the Hebrew people, God's chosen people, not to miss God's chosen Son, not to miss the Messiah for whom they were waiting and watching. And then finally, the third point that we want to consider today is Jesus' radical reorientation from a Davidic kingdom of God, uh, uh, and uh, to or from a Davidic kingdom to the kingdom of God. And it's important to understand in these conversations, particularly this is true in Matthew, that uh, the phrase "kingdom of God" and "king" are used interchangeably. Okay. So let's talk about the first little point of all of this: Jesus' radical reorientation from a Davidic kingdom. What were the days of the Hebrew people like during the days of David with King? Were they good or bad? How many say good? You're right. They were good days. They were good politically. They were good from a military perspective. They were good from an economic perspective. Influence was great. Everybody wanted to be a part of this nation. The armies of the Hebrews come and people are afraid and in retreat. There's power. There's influence. It was a time of, uh, of, of uh, godly righteousness in terms of that nation. And that was what the uh, church, that was what the people of the temple, the leaders of the temple anticipated when they thought about the promises of a Messiah who would establish a kingdom. They longed for the good old days. They wanted to be a part of what their ancestors had told them. It, was, it used to be like this. And so they would look for the Messiah. They hoped for the Messiah. They wanted the Messiah to come because they said, it's a good thing when the Messiah shows up. But the good thing was the memory of what it was like, the stories of what it was like when David was king. It had everything to do with politics and religion and ec economics and education and influence and power. It had very little to do with Jesus. So Jesus is asking them for a reorientation from the kingdom of David to the kingdom of God. If you have your Bible and, and look at, uh, again at, verse, uh, at chapter 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed, and, and you just go through this, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the, and the Hebrew people heard this and they're saying, wait a minute, that's not how we imagined it. That's not what we've been waiting for, is it? They long for the good old days, the stories of what it was like when David was king, and Jesus shows up and says, blessed are you when people persecute you. Wait a minute. That's not what we were hoping life would be. So Jesus is asking them for a 
radical reorientation from the kingdom of David to the kingdom of God. And, and it's important to hear the interchangeability of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Let me just restate verse 10 again. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for they belong to Jesus. Now, when you hear it like that, you see, when you hear the interchangeability, suddenly what you're receiving is a proposition that says there is nothing more important than knowing, loving, following, believing, trusting in Jesus Christ. That's the business of Messiah, you see. It's not a proposition. It's a person. It's not a memory. It's a reality that is immediate and eternal. And the invitation, the invitation is yours. The invitation is yours. So Matthew wanted to make sure that God's Old Testament people, the, the, the Hebrew people, were, um, would get this, that they would see this, that they would believe this. You see, here's the deal. The Hebrews were a lot like the Beatles. And you say, wait a minute. Steve, come on. We know tonight's the, the night when they're going to be at the Ed Sullivan Theater and they're going to be remembering the Beatles and that, and that, and that. I, I, I'm staying with my sister. She's out of town, but she gave me a key to her house, which could be a major mistake on her part, but I'm trying to be really nice and take care of things. Her cat only knocked one thing over last night, but I caught it before it broke, so I'm really happy to do that and, and that, at that, uh, that this lamp is in one piece, and I've learned not to scare that cat, you know, a little bit because he knocks things over. But uh, if I can no learn how to turn on the TV, I'm going to be watching a little bit of the Beatles tonight. And you know what the Beatles, remember their great song? Yesterday, all my troubles, what? Seem so far away. I believe in what? Yesterday. And you know what Jesus came saying? While I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. He didn't actually say that, but that's what the Hebrews said of him. He was saying, guys, this isn't about yesterday. This is about today and forever. Jesus was introducing a kingdom that, as Lutheran people, we say is a now and not yet reality. Does that make sense to you? Does it, I mean, it's sort of a paradox. It's now, but not yet. The first speech that Jesus gave wasn't the Sermon on the Mount. It was the speech that started off like this. He said, the time is now and the kingdom of God is at hand. He could have said, the king is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Something goes on now, but the kingdom of God and heaven and eternal life isn't fulfilled, isn't complete until the moment in which it is entered by what we would call death on our side of the equation on the other side of the equation, it is a door that opens into life that is more abundant than we've ever imagined and is eternal. You see, it's kind of like being born. Kind of like being born. So that's the, that's the kind of shift that Jesus was after as he, um, as he um, began to give this very memorable speech. There's something now and not yet. It's not all about what used to be. Fall in love with today and tomorrow. Don't be a beetle. I believe in yesterday. No, believe in Jesus and believe in today and believe in the eternal life that he purchased and won for us in his death and in his rising again. So now we sort of come back into Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Don't judge or you will be judged. And, and I, I have to tell you, I, I look at that and um, the hymnody of the 8 o'clock service, the, the comment that Pastor Zach made when he was talking about uh, standing um, uh, with, with Jesus at, at, toward the end of the message, and he used the term arrogance, and, and, and I, I was listening very carefully to that part of it because my question becomes, is Jesus talking about judging and, and uh, the way that we deal with others as a symptom of sin, or is he talking about something that is a root cause, 
a root cause. And with Pastor Zach, and by the way, uh, though he and I have had multiple conversations this week so that uh, uh, I knew what he was going to be talking about. He knows what I'm going to be talking about. We sort of uh, got connected kind of like the staff at Concordia does. But uh, one of the things that both of us understood is that we're really talking about something when you get at this business of judging and, and, and this little section of the, the, the memorable speech. We're really talking about something that is symptomatic of something much deeper and much more perverse, much more broken. Judging another person, and I'll get into what that means in a few moments, is not the bottom line issue. Yes, sin, we could say, is the bottom line issue, but this particular quote from C.S. Lewis, for me at least, helps to create a, a context in which I can understand better the words of Jesus. And if you'll just look at what Lewis is writing, I do not think I have ever heard anyone who was not a Christian accuse himself of this vice. In other words, people who aren't Christians aren't even thinking about this. They don't even care. Okay, that's how blind we are to, to the notion of sin apart from, from Jesus Christ, left to our own natural inclinations, the blindness to this. And at the same time, I have very seldom met anyone who was not a Christian who showed the slightest mercy in it to others. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. So other people can see this problem in us, but we don't see it ourselves. And the more we have it in ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. The vice I am talking of is pride or self-conceit. Pastor Zach used the term arrogance today in the message. Pride or self-conceit. And the virtue opposite to it in Christian morals is humility. Pride leads to every other vice and is the complete anti-God state of mind. That is the most amazing statement that I've read in the last um, two or three days. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm sitting here going, how do I want to say this? I, the most amazing stuff comes out of the Scriptures, obviously. But, but I was so profoundly moved. A friend of mine, uh, in having conversation about this Bible class, shared this quote with me. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. My pride, my arrogance, my conceit destroys me and is the root cause and, and is the root, ex let me say it like this, is the root expression of sin, of sin. The Bible says in other places that God resists the pride. He, he resists the proud, but he gives what to the humble? He gives grace to the humble. Resist the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So we're dealing with uh, behaviors, yes, but we're also, Jesus is going at this whole issue, bottom line, of what pride is. So, so let's go back to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge or you will be judged. For the same way you judge others, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. the specifics of this text. First of all, do not judge. What has happened here is that in the Hebrew community, in the context of the, of the temple and the holy of holies is kind of a centerpiece to how this community takes on its identity, what has happened over the course of time is the Ten Commandments have become 613 commands. And there are some people who excel at this, who've given their lives to studying this and excel. And they're in this crowd. They're in the crowd. And one of the things that they're very good at is not only measuring these commands, but it's also separating themselves from other people by judging them based on the commands that they have mastered and learned to keep. As a matter of fact, they're so good at it that Jesus says to the disciples, I don't know if he spit and anybody got wet, but they're right in front of him. Jesus says to the disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness 
of the Pharisees, you'll never get into the kingdom of heaven. That's like sending a shockwave. That's horror to these guys because they, knew, they were fishermen, tax collectors. They're sort of people from the fringe. These are the ones who, who don't excel so, so well at all. And they know that the experts, the experts are the Pharisees. These guys are seventh grade, third string sports team that will never make the varsity. But unless you exceed that righteousness, you'll never enter into the kingdom of God. Let me just share with you uh, this, this whole business of kind of doing the math here. 613 commands is 365 commands that said, Thou shalt not, and 248 commands that said, Thou shalt, thou shalt, and that should be 613. Do not judge. You see what happens when you're a command keeper, when your life is passionately engaged with keeping the rules and somehow your own excellence is perceived as being something that God would be, with what, with something with which God would be pleased, that somehow it earns God's approval is really, is really a, a kind of false holiness, a false holiness. And that's what Jesus is uh, contending with right here. It's the corruption of the gospel. It's, it's a performance-based culture. It's a shame-based culture for those who haven't accomplished quite as much as you have. Well, one of the things that we'll do to motivate them to do better and try harder and give more of themselves into this endeavor is we'll just make them ashamed. We'll just shame them into being better people. It's a false kind of holiness, and Jesus said it is an utter corruption of the gospel. You can't be good enough. You can't excel enough. You can't earn God's pleasure, God's approval. Impossible for you. The good news is that the character of God is one of love. The good news is the character of God is one of grace. The good news is that the character of God is one of mercy. Pastor Zach pointed that out very well in the message today one of mercy. And this notion of judging is described like this. The word in uh, the New Testament language is unfair criticism, separation, discrimination, prejudice. That's where self-righteousness leads. That's where pride takes you and me. It's me stepping into the little commercial song of uh, a few years ago that says, my dog's better than your dog, <laughs> you know? That's where pride takes us. And it takes us right to the precipice of utter, complete, eternal destruction. Don't be unfair and critical toward others. Don't separate yourselves from others. Don't discriminate under the, under the umbrella of, of false holiness against others. Don't be prejudiced against others thinking you're better than, than the other person is. Don't do that. It will kill you. It's deadly in every single way. Or you will be judged or you will be judged. The word judged here is a term that's used interestingly uh, in, the, in the syntax of the, of the uh, New Testament language. It's a term that typically is, uh, uh, the way it's set up in the sentence, it's usually uh, a, a term that means something happened in the past. This particular uh, construction of this sentence means that this is something that is so sure it's going to happen in the future. 
The judgment of God is so sure. The judgment of God is such a reality that we can think of it as being a, a constant, both past, present, and, and future. The judgment that you bring against others, while it may help you feel good about yourself, the separation that you use to, to create space between you and other people and to, and to create in your mind a kind of an advantage and preference over others, that space will come back to be God's judgment against you. This is serious business. Serious business. So the specifics of the text get with this, address the corruption of the gospel, and it says, do not superimpose rules over something that God says is a gift. Okay? Then number two, we get into this little section about the speck and the plank. Why do you look at a speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. From the brother's eye. Well, it's sort of an interesting, uh, this is sort of an interesting thing. Actually, actually, and Jesus does this from time to time. He quotes other literature. He may quote a psalm. We see that in the Gospels. He may quote a hymn out of the liturgies of the, of the temple, and we see that. Here, uh, he is uh, uh, quoting an, an Aramaic Saying it's just a, it's a part of the common vernacular of of, uh, of the Aramaic people. Now remember, I and I think I said this last time I was here. You remember when you think about Jesus and you think about his birth, he was a Galilean Aramaic speaking Jew. Okay, the Word became flesh and lived among us. When he was born in this world, he was a Galilean Aramaic speaking Jew. That's Jesus with skin on. Okay, so wouldn't it make sense? that this Galilean, Aramaic-speaking Jew, that Matthew would remember by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he'd remember that comment when he used this, this uh, Aramaic uh, expression about a plank and a speck and that sort of thing. So there is that, uh, there is that uh, business of connection. And, and what's the point of this? What's the point of this little saying? The point is found in this phrase, then you will see clearly. As long as you are superimposing your rule keeping over what it means to be holy, what it means to know God, what it means to have confidence in your salvation. As long as you are superimposing rules over that category, you're not seeing at all. That's why Jesus would use expressions like, can the blind lead the blind? No, the blind can't lead the blind. Jesus said, both fall into a ditch. You must see clearly. So why is it that in the Gospel of Matthew that the, the memorable speech from John the baptizer is this, repent and believe the Gospel? What do you think he's asking people to do? He's saying, let's start pulling planks out of our eyes. It starts with you. It starts with you. Why would Mark remember the first public proclamation of Jesus? The time is now. The kingdom of God is at hand. What? Repent and what? Believe the gospel. That message occurs again and again and again, and it's a part of the program. It's a part of the public proclamation. It's at the heart of the message of John. It's at the heart of the message of Jesus. And for people to connect to it and to help them get it, Jesus, the Galilean, Aramaic-speaking Jew, uses an Aramaic expression. Hey, you remember this one? Sawdust, plank, get it out of your eye. Why? So that you will see clearly. You see, as long as it is about self-aggrandizement, as long as it is about self-accomplishment, as long as it is about conceit and arrogance and pride, you're not 
seeing clearly. You hear kids say from time to time, well, this person gets it, and this person doesn't get it. What Jesus is saying, you guys who are playing games, you guys who are based in, who, who are living your lives in this performance-based, shame-based culture, don't get it. It's just the opposite. I want you to see clearly. Now, a part of our not seeing clearly is how we do pass judgment on other people. And, and uh, for years, I've, I've always sort of assumed that this was true, and I'll check this with you today, sort of see if you resonate this in your, in your own heart a little bit. And, and, and uh, I hate to keep referencing Pastor Zach's message like it was a good one, but it really was a, a, an extraordinarily good one. So uh, if you were thinking about maybe skipping 11 o'clock and going to Starbucks or gyms or something for brunch, uh, hang around. You're going to like what he's got to say. But he talks about how we judge other people. Remember when he was talking about the person who, who changed lanes in the, if you were in an 8 o'clock church? Okay, so I'm mad at that guy because he cut me off. But when I do it, I had this reason in mind, and it was justified. And, and uh, you know, shame on you for honking your horn at me, shaking your fist at me, you know. And, uh, uh, and, and here's, what it looks, here's what this means at the, at, at the end of the day. We tend to judge others by what they do. We tend to judge ourselves by what we intend to do. Does that make sense? I'm a whole lot easier on me than my mother ever was, I'm going to tell you. I'm a whole lot easier on me than my wife is. I'm a whole lot easier on me than my son and daughter than, I am on, uh, than they are on me, you see. It's okay for me to change lanes without uh, and, and put someone at danger because it's their fault they were in my blind spot. But when somebody else does it, you see, I can honk and shake my fist and scream at them. We tend to judge others more we're, we, by what they do. We tend to judge ourselves by what we intend to do. Now, if you're in a rules-based game, and accomplishment is significant, one of the things you do to get advantage, one of the ways that you gain leverage, one of the ways that you gain favor and notice with other people is being just a little softer on yourself and a little harsher on others. And add to that what I think is true, that the places where we know maybe we're not as accomplished as we want to be or ought to be, Whatever that behavior may be in our lives, we tend to really zero in on others where we see the same thing, where we see the same thing. Now, we judge. We become hypercritical. We become hyper-separatist. Uh, we are prejudiced. We uh, say we're just not like them. And that's pride. And it finds its expression in that way in this memorable speech. The image of dogs and, and pigs, one of the things, and, and this has always been, again, this is one of these kind of, um, oh, by, by the way, uh, I, I, I wanted to share something with you about seeing clearly. Let's go back up here to number two. About uh, uh, the point of the speck and the plank is, is in the, from the kingdom of God perspective, it is to draw us into repentance and, and deep faith. Um, from the perspective of the Aramaic and uh, uh, what the words are that Jesus uh, uses in this translation so that you will see clearly. I have a friend who says, nothing ever good happens when people are confused. Does that make sense? So if I don't see clearly and I'm confused about my categories and I'm, and I'm uncertain about uh, uh, what my standing is in the community, nothing good can happen. One of my favorite stories is about the mom who had five little boys. And they were all, I mean, they were young boys from age three to about age seven or eight. So there were lots of energy, five of them. And one day, they lived out in the country, and one day, it was quiet at their house. Now, when five little boys get quiet, you'd probably need to investigate what's going on. And so mom did. 
And she went out, looked through the house, couldn't find them, went out in the yard, couldn't find them, went into the barn, and sure enough, there they were. And each little boy, each little boy had a little baby skunk that he was holding in his hand. He's petting and playing with this little baby skunk. Mom's horrified. She yells, quick, run. Each boy picked up a skunk and then ran. (laughs) So here's the point. Here's the point. Nothing good happens when people are confused. Nothing good happens when people aren't clear. What Jesus Christ wants to have happen in people's lives as they go through this whole business of understanding the, the, the depths and darkness of sin is that in repentance, God offers forgiveness. And what we have to give to others is not another set of rules. What we don't, what, what we don't want to default to is this position that is greater than another because of what I have done in terms of keeping rules. The default is always to the grace and love and mercy of God in Jesus Christ, okay? And so let's look at number three, the image of dogs and pigs as being something unclean. And he says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Remember it said, don't be flip about this. Do you, do you begin to see how that the, the message, while it, it speaks to us, don't be harsh to other people, don't, you know, or they'll be harsh, you know, to you. Uh, it's just, it's, as I said, it's kind of soft in terms of what Jesus is, is doing here in this message, I think. It's a little bit soft. Don't be flip about sacred things. The image of dogs and pigs. The kind of dogs that are being described here, the kind of dogs that run wild in packs, and remember this is an ancient world. It's a, it's a, a rural kind of a world. It's villages, and, and there aren't leash laws. That's what I guess the point that I'm trying to make here in this uh, place. And, and so for animals to be feral would be uh, pretty common. So we don't, uh, we don't and, and, and they would be considered unclean. So don't give them what is sacred. Don't throw pearls to pigs. If you do, they'll trample them under feet and then turn and tear you into pieces. In other words, what you are describing as unclean, if you take and give them your rules, it is of no help to them at all. They will discover how it does not, um, uh, that it is not acceptable. It doesn't satisfy them in any way, and they will turn on you. They will resist you. They will turn against you. And Jesus talks about things unclean. Can we take just a minute to go back for for what this is? In, In other words, that which you call unclean, is not helped by rules. This is a big deal. Now, you got to kind of push into the dogs and push into the pigs and get past that kind of stuff and say, what's he talking about? It's simply this, that when you are considered unclean, you don't need another rule. You go back to Matthew, and you look at Matthew chapter 2. Who shows up in Matthew chapter 2? Who did Matthew devote a whole chapter to in the story, in the Christmas story of Jesus? Magi. Were they Jewish? No, they weren't. So if a Jew were looking at someone from Persia, that Jew would conclude this Gentile is what? Unclean. Unclean. Did the Magi come to learn about the rules, or did they come to worship the king? They came to worship the king. So we read on into Matthew chapter 3, and what is the f- one of the first criticisms that comes of Jesus? He is a friend of what? Sinners. Wow. So we look at uh, Matthew and there are two people in that genealogy who are not who are not Jewish. One is a woman named Ruth, and she is a Moabite, which is to say she comes from a culture that believes in a plurality of God, and it's not the God of the of the Jews and, and, and that sort of thing. And so you're reading along, and if you're Jewish, 
If you're Hebrew, you're going, Abraham, okay, yeah, he's the father of the Jewish name. Isaac, of course, he's the first. Ruth? Because she's not Hebrew, she would be thought of as being what? Clean or unclean? Unclean. She was a woman. Amongst all of these men of, of notoriety, that was pretty, um, please don't kill the messenger. I don't need any email from you. But the, but the fact of the matter is that she was not being in that ancient world considered at the same level as these men were. And then we go down just a little bit further, and here is one, here's the, the name of, of this woman who protected the spies that, that Moses had sent into the promised land when they came to Jericho. And she was a Canaanite. Why do you think those people are on that list? Because you see, like the Jews, they were unclean. But they don't need rules, you see. When you look into the gospel accounts, the single most common criticism of Jesus is that he eats with sinful people. Who are the shepherds in Luke chapter 2? You don't know who the shepherds are because they work seven days a week, 24-7. You don't know who the shepherds were because they were considered to be what? Clean or unclean? Unclean. They didn't come to the temple. They couldn't come to the temple. And they show up, and they receive the news. To you, shepherds and world, is born this day in the city of David. What? A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Christmas wasn't about giving out a whole new set of rules. It was about receiving a Savior, the person, Jesus the Messiah promised in this. The image of dogs and pigs is unclean. That's the point of it all. Guys, if you give them rules, they're not interested in rules, and they'll turn on you. All you're doing is building resistance. All you're doing is offering to them something that will never, ever satisfy. Does that make sense? So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. How do we turn this thing around? How do we take something that is so, frankly, I think, uh, intense? Um, this is not an easy message because it is a direct, in-your-face challenge to the dominant, defining, cultural worldview of, the, of Jesus' day among Jesus' people. He's saying, guys, this isn't it. This isn't even close to it. When he is engaged later in his ministry, and the same Pharisees who heard him talking about the inadequacy of 613 Mosaic laws that over time had emerged, and, and if you were a Sadducee, there are even more than that. It's a pretty sad state of affairs. But when those same people came to him to try to trick him and to try to find fault with him and to try to turn people against him. This is what Jesus said. And to me, it's the same kind of thing. Let's read this out loud together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. 613 rules just went flying out the window. The good old days of keeping the law just went flying out the window. Anybody that would stand up and say, I believe in yesterday, that nonsense just went flying out the window. Hey, it's real simple. Love God. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So, let's talk about uh, some action outcomes. And I, I want to do this under the 
under the uh, uh, kind of the umbrella of the, of the group that's right there in front of Jesus. Okay, we're, we're talking about the, the, the disciples here. So as a Jesus follower, that's who these guys are. There's, there's three things that I believe, that I believe, that, that, that come sort of emerging out of this text that are life-defining. Okay, life-defining. Why would this be the most memorable speech in history? Well, these three things are a part of it. Number one is I will trust, I will trust God's Word. Matthew 5, verse 18. Let me just read this for you briefly. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Until everything is accomplished. Jesus did not come to change the Scriptures. He didn't come to change the Torah. He didn't come to change the history. He didn't come to change the poetry. He didn't come to change the Old Testament. Not one smallest punctuation mark will I change. This is the truth. But we have to correct the understanding and the application of truth. We have to understand something about the, where the level playing field is. And it's, and it's captured in words like you find in the New Testament where all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I will trust God's word. Not the extrapolation of that word that has now been codified in how I ought to live and how other people might judge me. Number two, I will come to grips with pride in my life. I will come to grips with pride in my life. It's it's kind of that call to repentance. You know, when Luther nailed the 95 uh, theses on the door in in Germany, in in, in Wittenberg, uh, you, you know what the first of the 95 theses are? That every day, Every day is a day for me to repent of my sin. That life is intended to be a life. My life as a follower of Jesus is intended to be a life of daily contrition. There's no escape from that. I am a saint and a sinner at the same time, Lutheran theologians like to say. That's why Paul would say, the good that I would, I do not. That which I would not do, I do. Because the kingdom of God is now and not yet, you see. The kingdom of God is now and not yet. How do I know that? Because the king told me. The king told me. I will come to grips with pride in my life. 7 verse 5 says, You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Take the plank out of your eye first. Out of your eye first. First, don't be concerned so much and, and observant and, and distant and arrogant toward the kinds of sin that you see in others. First of all, have eyes to see clearly what that sin looks like in your life. So it's a, it's a call to repentance, and that's a good place to be because God promises to hear and to forgive our sins in Jesus Christ. And boy, oh boy, am I glad to see that back up because I hit the wrong button on this little thing. And number three, I will embrace the distinctions of faith and religion. I will embrace the distinctions of faith and religion. Religion is about rules. Religion is the kind of place where I can get comfortable with my progression and my accomplishment. And as a matter of fact, I, if, I'm, if I'm full of pride, I can even superimpose that on others and show you how you ought to be better. Show you where you're going wrong. Tell you how I used to be like you, but now it's, I'm in a better place. That's what religion is about. Faith is believing and trusting in Jesus Christ. So I embrace those kinds of distinctions. I want to share with you a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Somebody German has to show up in every Lutheran gathering, you know, and so this is, this is a pretty good quote. Judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace which others are just as entitled to as we are. You see, it's a level ground. It's a level playing field when you stand at the cross. It's a level ground in terms of encountering Jesus Christ. 
So, as I embrace the distinctions of faith and religion, let me kind of uh, close this thing off with a... Um, with a little quote that, that says this, as, as I think about um, what Jesus is saying when he's judging, and, and, or don't judge. When you read through the Gospels, Jesus saves four groups of people, okay, four groups of people, and I just want to list these out for you. The wayward, the uninterested, the self-righteous, and every tribe, every tribe. And one of the great places where he brought that out clearly is in the place where he talked about a sower going out to see, sow seeds that fell in different kinds of soils. He came to save all. That's a part of the reason why Matthew, let me just catapult us to that point when he says, go and make disciples of all peoples, all peoples, because I came to save all. So let me close, and then we're going to be on our way. Colossians 2, verses 16 through 18. I used to tell my parents, or I, I used to, I, let, me, let, me, let me say it like this, let me back it up. I used to tell my wife um, that they'll, we'll, we'll know what our kids thought was important and all of the things that we said to them and all of the things that we um, um, did and, and, and shared with them, we'll know what they thought was most important when they have children and start raising them. So all we have to do is listen. Okay? It's at that second iteration. It's at that third generation where you find out what your kids heard you say, okay, when they start raising their own. Now, my son uh, is 31 years old, and he and his wife do foster parenting. And uh, they have their second child, but their first boy. And so I told Rita, I said, I can't wait for Lance and Vaden to get here because I want to hear how Lance talks of Aiden. I'll know what he actually heard all, the, all those years that he was living at our house. Because kids can be like cats, you know. Cats don't have a large vocabulary. So we have a cat whose name is Maverick, and uh, he likes to scratch in the carpet in places where he shouldn't. And, but this is what I know goes on. When he starts scratching, he hears Rita go, Maverick! Then he hears, yada, 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 yada. So Maverick will never teach another cat not to scratch on the carpet. He doesn't get it. Well, I want to close with Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 through 18, because this is Paul who was redeemed by Jesus. You remember that on the road to Damascus. And now he is teaching people for whom he serves as pastor what the gospel and, and all of this business is about. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. That's exactly what the Pharisees were using as they passed judgment on others. Don't let anyone judge you by these things. These are a shadow of things that were to come. Now, please understand, I'm not speaking against those kinds of things. Jesus didn't come to change the law. He came to change the understanding of the law. These kinds of things, as they point to a God who is alive and creating and redeeming and sanctifying people, are helpful, but they are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. When we judge others by shadows, that's the arrogance to which Jesus is speaking. Don't do that. The substance of the gospel, the substance of the scriptures, the substance of that moment and all of the moments to come is found in Jesus Christ. He'll be the judge, but more importantly, he'll be the Savior and King. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love and grace to us in Jesus Christ, and we know that as we learn and understand sometimes what it means to step back from people or to be uh, hypercritical of others, prejudicial toward others, to distance them from ourselves, that's not the way of Christ, but most importantly, it helps us to understand more of the just continual struggle of our own pride and arrogance and our continual need for a Savior now and always. 
And so be present with us, Lord Jesus, now and always. We pray it in your strong and precious name. Amen. Amen.